Hi folks, my name is Adam and I like to make tiny nerdy things. And a few days ago I was stress eating a Toblerone bar and thought to myself, Hey, you know what this kind of looks like? So naturally I'm going to start with the Toblerone bar. Or rather the box. I mean, you could make it out of the bar and eat the box, but then unless you've got pica, you'd probably still be stressed. Of course, to reduce any chance of Toblerone-related distraction, I recommend eating the entire bar in once. After all, it's damn near impossible to focus on anything when you know that there is a triangular tube of Swiss gold sitting in your cupboard. The box will form the skeleton of my prison, but thin cardboard isn't really ideal for carving detail into, so I'm going to frame the box in some thin sheets of XPS foam. Little tool I'm using here is a marking gauge for woodworking, but it works wonder for making straight lines in foam. Once I've cut my side panels down, I'll find the center, then mark out two straight lines off center of that. Then I can use a small hole punch to cut an arch in the top, and with the two lines cut, I've now got that weird centery dealy thing in the middle of the prison wall. I'll repeat the same process for the other two sides, and I've got my frame essentially built up. From what I can see in still shots from the few times it shows up in the movies, Azkaban is mostly made of big old stone bricks, so I want to make these walls bricky. Unfortunately, this means that I need to carve out roughly 12 million tiny bricks by hand, which means it's time for a little redneck engineering. The idea here is that if I clamp a bunch of these blades together, then I should be able to cut the initial straight lines in chunks rather than one by one. It also means that they'll be nicely spaced out since the blades are the perfect width for how large I want my bricks to be. If I wanted them to be slightly wider, then I could add little strips of tape or even paper in between as spacers. Sadly, I can't use the same method to cut the vertical bricks since it would be a perfect square grid and it just wouldn't look right. So instead I'm going to use a wire brush and stab my bricks into place. I know it sounds stupid, but it works an absolute treat. Because of the size of the initial cuts and the random placement of the wires on the brush, it ends up looking just like what I imagined a weathered worn brick wall in the middle of the ocean would look like. If it's stupid but it works, is it really that stupid? Then of course I repeated the process for the other sides and I'm ready to glue them onto my Toblerone box. Instead of cutting sharp corners to make the corners, I'm just going to shape it using a little bit of gap filler. And some longtime viewers of my channel will recognize this pail of filler as a recurring guest star on my show since it's one of my favorite materials to work with. So if any of the marketing managers from Everbuild are watching, hit me up. Otherwise, I've taped off the foam so that I don't fill any of my tiny bricks, and I'm just going to get the general shape of the corners blocked in. This took a few layers to build it up properly and a non-zero number of hours to get it sanded down flat and sharp. Then once it's thoroughly dry, I can cut the bricks into the gap filler using the exact same technique as I used to make the foam bricks. To fill in the center of the prison, I'm going to cut a couple slightly thinner sheets of XPS foam to slide down the center, then I can mark them out and cut them off flush with the top of the prison wall. And then I'm going to take a minute to realize that I just used a razor sharp blade to cut through the foam while using my finger as a depth gauge. Safety of course is always my number one priority. To cover the ugly gap between the two wall sections, I've cut a triangle to fit on top, then cut another triangle out of that. And then finally, I'll add just a tiny bit of detail before gluing it into place. Now to make the band that runs around the perimeter of the prison, I'm just going to use some string. A little glue will hold it in place, and some gap filler will blend it into the wall, and that's pretty much the prison finished. Spare chunks of thicker foam will work perfectly for making our rocky outcropping upon which the tiny Azkaban sits, and then a bit of hot glue will hold the two pieces together. Then I can mark out where the prison will sit, and then it's a simple matter of cutting and tearing until I've got an appropriately rocky outcropping. Now while I'm terraforming in the background, I'd like to thank my newest patrons. Joshua Kahn, Casti Schmidt, Stefan Doomcandy Wunderlich, Anne Frischberg and Martin. It's folk like you that make this channel possible, so if you'd like to help me make tiny nerdy things, then follow the link in the description below. Of course, sharing this video, commenting, and subscribing make a huge difference as well, so help a brother out and tell your friends. With the base built, a lot of hot glue will hold the prison in place and I can get started adding the weird little extras onto the bottom of the prison. It's hard to find any references for how the prison is shaped since it's never actually described in any of the books since Harold never saw it. 
That being said, I loved how ominous the triangular shape from the movies was, and there are some terrific pieces of concept art that have the bottom flaring out into a sort of wave breaker. I really like this design because it's awful spooky looking, but it also makes sense because you need something to break the waves and keep them from battering into the front of the prison. I didn't really take any measurements because, you know, I don't really do that. Instead, I opted to simply cut pieces out until I liked how they looked and how they fit. And then as always, I filled the gaps with my favorite gap filler. So this will be a post Bellatrix Lestrange escape and a pre-fixing the big freaking hole in the wall Azkaban. So I need to cut a big freaking hole in the wall. To prime the model and make it a little bit more durable, I'm going to mix a bit of gray and white paint into some Mod Podge. This will give it a nice light gray undercoat and make it a lot more durable. I could use primer, but I find the airbrush primer takes a little too long to cure, and the spray primer has a tendency to melt foam, so Mod Podge is a faster, safer solution. Black Mod Podge is my go-to for this sort of thing, but I want to wash the rocks on the bottom, so a light gray base coat saves me a few steps. With the base coat cured, it's now time to give the prison bricks and bottom wave breaker thingy majiggy a nice dark gray, making sure to get into all the nooks and crannies. And once that dries, I'll cover the entire model in a black wash. This will seep into all the tiny bricks and really make them stand out. And then once I apply it onto the rocks on the bottom, it'll seep into all the recesses and really add some depth to those as well. I've come to really love washing rocks rather than painting them directly since I love the way they look with a series of blacks, grays, and browns. I make all my own washes using a mixture of acrylic ink, matte medium, water, and flow improver. These all get combined into... Uh, I don't... I don't... No, basically I mix them together until I'm happy with the consistency and flow. When I mix them, I like to have a spare piece of terrain to test the mixture on, and then once my wash reaches a nice balance of pigment and flow, I call it good. Once the washes have dried, I'll dust everything in a series of lighter and lighter gray dry brushes. You know I love me a good dry brush, and this is when all those tiny bricks really start to stand out. The final painting stage will be adding some little streaks that run along the center thing that runs the perimeter as well as some selective sections along the top and a few of the bigger bricks. This is the sort of step that really elevates the prison and takes it from being a simple grey building with black wash on top to a beautiful grey building with grey highlights and a black wash over the top with random black wash streaks. It's a veritable monochrome rainbow. I had such a good time in my last video pouring a resin ocean that I thought I'd try and do it again. However, this time I'm going to give not being a dumb dumb a shot and see if it works out a little bit better. I've cut out a strip of perspex long enough that I can bend it into a roughly 20 centimeter wide circle, then using all of the hot glue, I'm going to attach it to the bottom and carefully make sure that it is waterproof. To try and reduce bubbles caused by the foam reacting to the resin, I'm going to coat the base of the model with a gloss varnish. In hindsight, I don't actually know if this does anything, but it's one of those things that made a lot of sense at the time. It would be pretty on brand for me to come back 48 hours later to find my prison floating on top of a rock hard resin ocean, so I'll use a little UV resin to hold it all in place while the two part resin cures. I want my ocean to be really dark and foreboding, so I'm going to tint it pretty heavily with black and blue. Now the last time that I used this brand of resin, I tried tinting it using acrylic paints and it left a lot of little floating bits suspended in the water. I was able to pretend like it was intentional and that it was just some floating ocean detritus, but given the scale of this, I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So this time, I'm going to try using inks instead of paints, and naturally, I'm not going to test it at all and just go right ahead and add it to my full pot of resin. Then it's just a case of pouring it into my mold and hoping for the best. And lo and behold, the resin gods have smiled upon this simple crafter. It's mostly bubble free, nothing leaked out, and I am left with a perfectly ominous bluish black ocean. Some of my viewers commented that you can use isopropyl alcohol to loosen hot glue and oh my god it's amazing. The second you spray it on you can hear the acrylic cracking underneath and alcohol as it turns out is good for more than just thinning glue and overcoming social anxiety. I'll clean up all the edges where the resin crept up the walls of the mold and then I can get started adding the waves. My weapon of choice today is going to be crystal clear silicone. I like this stuff because it's the stuff I have and I like to use the things that I have. 
Making the waves is pretty straightforward. I'll just squeeze out some globs of silicone roughly where I want the waves to be, and then I'll smooth the general shape out using my finger. Spritzing it with alcohol will keep my fingers from sticking and will help smooth the waves out. To make sure the underlying section cures, I'll also build the waves up in a few layers until I get the height that I'm after. Now I did spend all that time making a big wave breaker on the front of the island, so of course I'm going to make a big wave to break upon it. This is built up in the exact same way with a big blob of silicone shaped into a big wave, and then I'll poke it and prod it as it cures to help maintain that big wave shape. So now I've got my waves in place, but they're not quite as foamy as I would like. To make some sea foam, I'll mix gloss Mod Podge with fine snow flock. I want it to reach a consistency that can be spread fairly easily, but I want it to hold its shape if I'm trying to build it up. Again, I really have no idea what the quantities are here, so I just mixed it until I was happy. Then with a brush and some stir sticks, I can apply it onto all the edges and tips of the waves and anywhere that I thought big splashy waves would become crashing off the rocks. I'm normally a big fan of the less is more approach, but sometimes I like to live life on the edge. So today I'm going with a more is more approach when it comes to the foam. Essentially, I'm going to treat the foam like Frank's Red Hot. I put that on everything. Then the absolute final step will be dusting the tips of the waves and any of the sections in between with little white paint. This helps to give it a bit of depth and helps the sea foam differentiate a little bit from the waves and any of the sections where I want the water to appear a little bit more turbulent. And then with those finishing touches, we're on to our glamour shots. As always, thanks for watching, and if you like what you saw, let me know in the comments below. If you haven't subscribed yet, now is a great time to do so, as I upload new videos every week, and if you've got a great idea, let me know below, and I'll add it to the ever-growing list of stuff I may never get enough time to finish. Otherwise, we'll, uh, see you next time. Cheers!